thank you to the friends of Imperial, to our friends for, for inviting us. So I can't be in person in front of you as, as we would have liked, but this is the next best thing. So let's see if I don't fail at the hurdle of sharing my screen. And you will let me know. That's fine. That's if good. this works and okay. try to come up with a laser pointer here. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to talk to you today about a big problem in physics. We call it the dark matter problem because it is a big problem. It's actually preventing us from advancing in fundamental physics, particle physics, astrophysics, cosmology, because we don't really know what this dark matter is. And I'm sure that you will have heard, you will have heard the terms dark matter, but the question is, what is it? Um, we're trying to solve it uh, by mining for WIMPs. And so that's the title of my, my talk. How do you mine for WIMPs, which is one of the dark matter candidates? And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about the LZ uh, dark matter experiment. I'm going to start by showing you the results of a computer simulation, which looks quite, uh, quite simple, but it's actually quite a complex computer simulation. So you start by a set of masses, of test masses, maybe a billion of these masses, and they're just small masses that you distribute kind of uniformly. And then in a computer code, you code encode gravity. So these masses are only affected by gravity, and each pair of masses is affected by the gravitational laws uh, between them. And you do that between each mass and each other mass. And clearly, you can't really do that because that would be a huge number of uh, a huge computing problem. But uh, uh, you do this in some approximate way that allows you to understand how a system like this will evolve under gravity. So you code all of this system and you allow it to evolve for about a few billion years, which is more or less the age of the universe. And, and so this is what you end up with. Uh, the system that we started with had a mass more or less similar to the mass of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this system has a total mass if you sum up all the little test masses that you, that you are looking at. And that total mass is similar to what we think the Milky Way contains. And if you look at this, it's a three-dimensional uh, distribution and it's kind of lumpy and it really looks nothing like the Milky Way that, uh, that, we, have, uh, that we have in mind, the picture of the Milky Way that we have in mind. But in fact, the key to this mystery is here in this length scale, which is 80 of these kiloparsec units, which is a very large distance. And so in fact, this is about twice the, 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 the span of, of the Milky Way itself. So if you, if you were to place the disk of stars that we call the Milky Way, uh, it would actually fall quite in the center of this. And, and so the message from here is that you are looking at what we think is the distribution of dark matter in our galaxy. It gives most of the mass to our galaxy, and it radically changes the picture that we have our, of our own galaxy. So our own galaxy is not simply a, a spiral of, of stars and gas uh, uh, that is quite luminous uh, and, and with, with the Earth... Uh, uh, with the Earth more or less two-thirds of the way out. In fact, this is all embedded in a halo of dark matter. And that dark matter has a total mass which is much larger uh, than, than the, 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 what, we are, what we used to call uh, the Milky Way. Um, so how do we know all of this? There are many pieces of evidence for dark matter. And in fact, it's an embarrassingly old problem. The first piece of evidence dates back to the 1930s, to the early 1930s. I'm going to, not going to talk about that, but there, are, there is very interesting and convincing evidence that we still believe today that points to this uh, non-visible uh, component of, of matter. But it was largely ignored even in, within the astronomy fields until maybe the early 1970s, when people like Vera Rubin and Ken Ford at Stanford start, start started to measure how galaxies uh, rotate. Uh, and so to do that, you have a spectrometer mounted on your telescope. You try to find a spiral galaxy that you catch edge on. So your spectrometer is measuring along the, uh, the plane of the galaxy. And it's a little bit like doing a, a radar measurement. So essentially, you are measure, measuring the Doppler shift of the light as you move from the center of the galaxy to the edge of the galaxy. You are move, moving how the starlight shifts to the red if it's moving away from you or to the blue if it's moving towards you. And you do that as a function of the center uh, of your distance to the center of the galaxy. And so clearly for a spinning disk like what we are seeing here, uh, you can imagine that your bright disk of stars is this part in the center and maybe your dark matter distribution is that part towards the edges. If you do this for a rigid disk, then your rotational speed is clearly linear 
as a function of distance to the center. So if you move from the center here outwards, you see that the stars on the periphery are moving faster. And for the rigid, rigid disk, which is not particularly interesting, it's a linear dependence. And you can also calculate what this should look like for an ordinary galaxy. So you expect your rotation speed to increase as you go towards the center. So you start here and you move outwards. You expect this speed to increase a, a bit because you have more gravity pulling you and making you move faster. But at some point, especially after you move away from the disk of stars, you expect that speed of rotation to go down. Because we know that gravity uh, affects two bodies less the further apart they are. And that's essentially, if you are at the other end of the universe, you do not expect a galaxy to be affecting the way you move. So clearly, this has to go to zero uh, over some distance. And this is clearly the expectation that people have that if you move away from the center and go past the disk of stars, this rotation speed should be dropping off. Unfortunately, this is not what is measured. And so I'm showing it here one measurement, which is the M33 galaxy, which is a companion of the Milky Way. But we have now have data for thousands of galaxies and they, they, they behave more or less in the same way. So this is the rotation velocity in, in kilometers per second for the stars as a function of the distance to the center. This is what you expect to see. So as soon as you move past, past the disk of stars, you expect this velocity to start dropping. But this is what the data is telling us, that in fact it increases and it either remains pretty constant uh, or in this case it even increases a little bit. At some point you run out of starlight and, and you can still use gas. So there is gas in sort of the, the outer regions of galaxies, uh, this hydrogen gas that you can still measure. And you can ca carry on measuring via Doppler shift how this, uh, this uh, 21 centimeter line from hydrogen um, behaves and it carries on on the same trend. So even out here where there is there are no visible objects uh, except a little bit of gas, you can see that that velocity is not dropping. And so there is a big, big issue here. So they repeated this measurement uh, for a dozen galaxies. We now have thousands of them. They're all behaving more or less in the same way. Uh, and there are other pieces of, of evidence, as I'll mention in a second, which actually are not based on galaxy scales. So they are bigger scales than galaxies or even clusters of galaxies or even super clusters of galaxies. And we see exactly the same behavior, that things out there in the universe are moving much faster than they should be if the gravity is created by what we know is there from normal visible matter. So the picture of the universe that we now have is actually quite interesting, if not distressing, is that the energy content of the universe, which is represented in this pie, is only made up of the ordinary matter that we know about, which is the atoms and, and, and all of the particles that we know from the standard model of particle physics that make up you and me and, and stars and everything, only make up about 5% of the density of the energy or total amount of energy in the universe. And in fact, there is a lot more dark matter that, uh, th than there is matter. And in fact, there is another component, which is this dark energy component, which is even more mysterious than dark matter. For dark matter, we have very good candidate theories about what this thing could be, and we think it's a particle. It, there is debate about which particle it is, but at least we know how it behaves uh, in, in, in the universe at smaller scales and larger scales. Dark energy, we know uh, less, and, and, and uh, this is something that is now beginning to change, but it's an even more mysterious substance than ma dark matter. But the bottom line is we really know about 5% of what makes up the universe, uh, which is a, a very strange state of affairs. We have theories that explain how the universe evolves, given that it's made of these three fluids, a bit of normal matter, uh, a lot of dark matter, and even more dark energy. So if you, you assume that the universe is made of these three things, we understand how the universe evolves and forms structure and so on very well. But the problem is we cannot tell you what is the dark matter and what is the dark energy at the microscopic level. So I try to capture a related point here, which is to reassure you that the only evidence we have for dark matter does not only come from the rotations of galaxies. In fact, there is a dozen, two dozen pieces of evidence for dark matter and they all fit into place. And one neat thing that I like is that these pieces of evidence for dark matter come from different scales on the sky. So we have, um, for example, we can observe, so this is the, the history of, of the universe from a, a hot big bang at the beginning about 14 billion years ago, and this is the present time. And this is the formation of, of, of matter particles and light particles and so on. And this is essentially, this part here is, is, is the cosmic microwave background radiation. 
uh, which is essentially when the universe was about 380,000 years old, and it's basically a soup of protons and electrons and photons. So it's when the universe formed the first atoms and it became transparent, and we can measure this radiation very precisely. And what we can see is that there are very, very tiny temperature fluctuations uh, um, across different, uh, different scales. And when we analyze the distribution of those temperature fluctuations, which are actually very small, it's one part in 100,000. So what you see here is actually sort of zoomed in uh, quite a lot. And we can tell that there is an amount of dark matter which is not protons, is not electrons, is not neutrinos, is not anything else. So even at that time, 380 years after the Big Bang, we can only explain the size of those fluctuations if there is a component of black matter, which is the 27% I showed you. But then the universe starts forming structures. And so the universe forms structures in a very hierarchical way. What we now see is the superstructures form first, and within those, you start forming clusters of galaxies, and within those, you start forming galaxies, and within, the, within those, you start forming stars. And we have evidence for black matter at every stage of the, of the evolution of the large scale structure of the universe. And, and it's a remarkably consistent picture that all of these energy scale, all of these length scales are giving us the same message that there is dark matter at a particular abundance that is consistent with what we see today. So in astrophysics, you know that looking, looking far away is looking back in time. Uh, and so the larger the structures that you see, the further away they are and, and, and the earlier in the, in the universe they came. They, they come. And so this tells you that dark matter exists at all scales and therefore it exists at all times, at least back to this, uh, back to this, uh, to this stage here of the cosmic microwave background. And we believe that those dark matter particles might have been formed in this region here and then evolved to give us uh, the, the structures that we see today. So that tells, allows us to tell a story that we think we understand. We understand that given that we think there is dark matter, how do things evolve? Given that we know there is dark energy, how do things evolve? But it does not tell us what dark matter is. Uh, and so one of the places to look would be among the particles we already know. Uh, and so these are the particles within the standard model of particle physics. So these are the matter particles, the quarks and the, and the leptons, and these are the force particles, the gauge bosons, and then the newly discovered Higgs boson uh, is here. So most of the mass of the universe is actually in these particles here. So two, two ups and a down quark make a proton and an electron and the proton make a hydrogen atom. There's lots of neutrinos as well. There's a lot of short lived particles that don't live for, they're not around for very long. So most of the mass of the universe that we know about is in these particles, but none of these particles has the right, uh, has the, has the right properties to be, um, to be the dark matter. Uh, we can also look at the mediators of forces. So these are the forces that mediate the interactions between these matter particles. And for example, the photon is the, is the, is the particle that mediates electromagnetic interactions. Uh, we know that dark matter does not really couple to photons because we would have seen it, because that means that dark matter would absorb light or would emit light, and we know it doesn't. So we, we can rule out this interaction here, which is the electromagnetic interaction. We know it doesn't interact with gluons either. So gluons are the mediators, the mediators of the strong nuclear force that keep nuclei bound together and keep uh, protons and neutrons and, 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 uh, and, and, and those particles made of quarks bound together. And we also know that dark matter does not interact with gluons. Otherwise, we would have found matter that contains strange particles, and we know that they're not there. But there is a possibility that dark matter may interact with these bosons here, the Z boson, the W boson, and maybe even the Higgs boson. So these are the mediators of the weak nuclear force. So the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactive decay, for example, uh, it, it is quite possible that dark matter might interact uh, with, with, with that force. And as the name implies, it's a very weak interaction, and so it would justify why we haven't seen it yet. So that's a possibility, but it's by no means a guarantee. So we know dark matter interacts with ordinary matter, gravitationally, because we see the gravitational effects, we hope that interacts in some other way as well. So this is the summary of our ignorance, I would say, uh, about what this dark matter is. So 
this here is the parameter space. There's a lot of echo. Somebody needs to mute. Okay. So this is the parameter space that covers all, all of the all of the masses of dark matter that we think are viable. And it extends from 10 to the minus 22 of these units, electron volts, which is a very, very, very low mass, to essentially 10 solar masses, which is a very, very large mass. So this plot here actually covers about 100 orders of magnitude in mass. And we, I cannot put hand on my heart and say we can exclude any of them. So clearly there are areas in this plot that are more favorable, favored theoretically than other areas. But there is no area here that we've completely ruled out. There are some slithers that we've ruled out within each of these, but uh, the, all of these will produce uh, viable dark matter particles. So just to orient you a little bit, uh, this is one giga electron volt. Uh, so I'm using in, use it units of energy because mass and energy are kind of the same thing. And what weighs one giga electron volt? Well, a proton more or less weighs a giga electron volt, one GeV. So this is the mass of a proton. Uh, so if you look at light atoms, they would be here. All the atoms weigh up to 250 protons or so. So all of the atoms we know weigh up to here. The Higgs boson weighs 125 protons. So that's here somewhere. Uh, and so there is a scale of candidates here, which is related to uh, the weak interaction, uh, which then produces a type of candidate that we'll discuss a little bit called the weakly interacting massive particle. So the WIMP is a particle that would interact via the weak force. And so this is not a particle, it's a, it's a whole set, it's a whole candidate, a whole set of candidates that would interact via the weak force. And a good, a well-motivated WIMP would, would exist between a GeV and maybe a hundred TeV or so. So these would be particles produced in the early universe that then evolve with the formation of structure of the universe. They are still around today. We can try to detect them because they would interact via the weak force. You can have heavier, heavier particles than that. You can, you can go up to this Planck, Planck mass, which is a very large mass in terms of particle physics. Uh, I try to look at something weighing the Planck mass. It's about uh, a pill of vitamin D. So the vitamin D is about 25 micrograms, which is, should be your daily dose of vitamin D. So that's kind of the Planck mass. And you can have fundamental particles up to this kind of scale. Uh, so this is a 10 to the 19 electron volts. So that's a, that's a very large mass. But then who's to say that in the same way that there is chemistry in the ordinary world and nuclear physics, that, that can be chemistry and nuclear physics in the dark matter world. So fundamental dark matter particles, for example, could combine to form, to form composite dark matter and nuggets and, 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 and grow their own structure independently and so on. So you have a whole class of candidates where the dark matter particles aggregate in some way via some chemistry or nuclear physics of their own and whether they communicate with our side of the universe, with our side of, of the matter spectrum or not is a different matter. They clearly communicate via gravity, but whether they do that via some other force uh, is not something we know. You can go a little bit further and then you start uh, getting into the realm of the large astrophysical objects. Um, a few years ago, we would not, not have gone as far as this, but now we are measuring black hole merger events in gravitational waves, as I'm sure you will have heard. Uh, with with the with the LIGO uh, set of detectors, and we are actually measuring more large black hole mergers than we thought were going to be there. And so people have started to wonder where do all these black holes come from, and why are they so heavy? And we don't quite understand this. So there is a type of black hole which does not come from the explosion of the star, which is the normal astrophysical formation mechanism, uh, which is proposed to come from the Big Bang, almost from the Big Bang itself. And these are primordial black holes that start out really very small but then gobble up all of the matter around them throughout the existence of the universe and end up now weighing a fraction of a, of a solar mass, maybe up to something like 10 solar masses and so, so. And because we are seeing a lot of black holes, people have started to speculate, could it be that black, these primordial black holes are actually the dark matter? And there is some merit in, 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 that, in, those, in those models, although some of that parameter space has actually been ruled out observationally, but not all. So it's not impossible that uh, that dark matter could be these primordial black holes. It's, it's, it's quite out there as a, as, as a theory, but it's not impossible. So then we look left in this diagram here. So there's, there's also this light dark matter. So for example, the mass of an electron is 500 keV. So it will be around here somewhere. 
uh, that could be a different type of neutrino that we haven't discovered. So that neutrino could be much, much heavier than the existing neutrinos, and it could be some of the dark matter, for example. We call it a sterile neutrino because it may not have weak interactions like the, norm, the normal uh, neutrinos. And by the time you get here, then we start to call this to the left wave-like dark matter. It's not because there is a hard distinction. It's because when you're talking about particles at such low energies, it makes more sense in physics to treat them as waves. And so then you can go back to this, in this direction, in this wave-like dark matter that some people call fuzzy dark matter. Uh, there are actually very good, well-motivated candidates here. The axioms are, are well, well-behaved wave-like dark matter. And you can keep traveling in that direction. So if you travel in that direction, the waves that you are talking about here are a significant fraction or a fraction of one galactic, one galactic uh, diameter. And so you know that it should, dark matter should not be much lighter than this, otherwise it, you find it difficult to reproduce the galaxy rotation curves if the waves you are talking about have a wavelength which is much longer than the size of your galaxy. And so we think this is a good place to stop, but this is in, in essence is a summary of our ignorance. So the dark matter could be hiding anywhere here. Some of these parameters, some of these parts are more favored theoretically than other parts, but maybe that's just a prejudice. And, and so I think in, in this, uh, what we call a no stone unturned uh, kind of approach that we now have, we try to be open-minded and say, okay, dark matter could be anywhere. So unfortunately, there isn't one experiment you can you can build to address all of this. In fact, no experiment will address more than, at most, one or two factors of 10. So a, a, a reasonably small slither of one of these, uh, one of these um, uh, ranges. If you build a WIMP detector, in fact, it can address maybe most of this, but it, most of the technologies address really only a, a little sort of a bracket of the, of, the, of the mass range. So I'm going to focus on these weakly interacting massive particles. And just to recap what we know about them, which is not a lot, is we know they have to be stable, or at least they have to be very long lived, because we know there was a dark matter problem already almost 14 billion years ago. And the dark matter problem is still here now. And so these particles are either stable or at least they decay in sequence to each other and they're all dark particles. And so in that case, it doesn't matter where which particle it is. Maybe there are several particles decaying from one to the other. But we know that, that they're either very long lived or they have to be stable. We know they have to be neutral because charged particles interact via the electromagnetic force and they're very easy to see. We can see uh, particles uh, that interact via electromagnetism, either via absorption or via emission very easily. So we know they have to be neutral. We know they have to be slow. So slow means not relativistic. They're not moving around fast like neutrinos are, for example. And the reason for this is that when you do those simulations of the universe, where you assume mass distributions and you look at how they evolve as, as, the, universe, um, as, as the universe gets older and older, Particles that are too fast don't allow you to grow, don't stay around long enough to form structures. And so, for example, if the dark matter were neutrinos, neutrinos are so fast that they actually stream out of the dense regions and take all the energy away. And then you can't form stars, you can't form structures because they just, they just diffuse away too quickly. So you want a particle which is actually slower than that. Uh, and, and, and so that's the reason for, uh, for calling this a type of cold dark matter. We don't want hot dark matter because those particles just move, they, they, they pump the energy away from the dense regions and you can't form a universe that looks like what, where we live in. Uh, and so we think they are produced in the early universe. We know they feel the gravitational force because that's how we know about this problem. And by design, and this is by no means guaranteed, but by design, the WIMP feels the weak nuclear force. So that's why they are called weakly interacting uh, massive particles. And why are they maybe the preferred candidate uh, with, uh, along with this axiom here, so the axiom and the WIMPs are, are, the, are the preferred, the preferred um, candidates, they solve a lot of problems with one theory. So if dark matter is WIMPs, you solve the astrophysical problem, the cosmological problem, and you form, you solve a lot of problems in particle physics. So the standard model we know is incomplete. We know there are things that are not quite right with it. For example, the mass of the Higgs boson and so on. And a WIMP type dark matter in many models actually solves those, those particle physics models too in a way which is completely independent uh, from dark matter. And so this would be a great solution because it actually fixes a lot of things that we know to be uh, sort of intention in fundamental uh, physics. 
but again, this is could be a prejudice if it is, if this is not a reason for black matter not to be somewhere else. It's just a reason that if you're going to look, maybe you, sh you should start to look there first. So how do we catch uh, a wimp? Um, we kind of know quite well, in fact, with a very reasonably small error bar, how much dark matter there is around us. So for example, in the Milky Way at the position of the sun, which is where we are, we know the density of dark matter to within 20, 30%. And, and that number has actually not changed very much in the, last, uh, in the last two or three decades. The error bar has got smaller, but we are more and more certain that we know the density of dark matter where we are. So then you can postulate what's the size of this particle. Let's say it's one GeV or 10 GeV or 100 GeV. And so you can calculate how many particles you have uh, where you are. And so if you assume your particle is a very rough 100 GeV, uh, close to the Higgs boson, for example, if you hold a pint, pint of beer, on average, you should have one wimp inside it at any given time. But if you look at this from the point of view of, of a flux, an even more interesting thing to think about is that you would have lots of these particles going through you all the time. So in fact, you can estimate that you have about 100,000 wimps crossing your fingernail per second, which is quite a lot. And we hope that one of these interacts, there's something in a particle detector that tells us it's there. Uh, that's not a very sort of, I think a very shocking realization because you can think that you have a lot of solar neutrinos going through your fingernail uh, as well. So there are 65 billion solar neutrinos going through your fingernail per second, and we don't e even, we, we, we're not even aware of this. So here again is another example of a weakly interacting particle, not massive, but the neutrino is a weakly interacting particle that we did not know about for decades and decades that goes through us all the time. It interacts not often, but sometimes, and, and we ended up detecting it. And so it could well be that WIMPs are exactly in the same situation, that we know the particle is there, it's just a very difficult technical challenge, but one day we will detect them. So how would we do this? Well, the simplest interaction is also the most difficult to detect. Uh, it's, it's just an elastic collision. So like a billiard ball kind of collision, the WIMP comes along, it knocks a nucleus in your radiation detector, and that recoil of the nucleus is what you detect. That's the simplest possible interaction. Anything more complicated than that is actually easier to detect. So we, we tend to focus on the simple elastic one, but all manner of other interactions in elastic interactions are easier. Uh, and so we focus on, on the elastic collisions. So we are looking for rare events because we know that the rate of WIMP interaction is going to be really very small. And we're looking at low energies and that's because the WIMP is not much heavier than for example, an atom and it's moving slowly. And so a slow object scattering from an object with a similar mass is not going to give you a big bang. It's going to give you a tiny, tiny blip in your detector that's going to be really small. The combination of looking for rare things which, are also, which also have low energies is very difficult. So in particle physics, looking for rare, rare events is not particularly difficult as long as they have high energy. And in other areas of physics, looking for low energies is easy as long as they happen a lot. The problem is you're trying to put these two things to get. So we need very special radiation detectors in, uh, in, in very quiet places. So I'm going to try to explain in a bit more detail what exactly are the challenges uh, that, that are upon us. So let's say that you have a, a kilogram detector that you build uh, at home and it's a very sensitive radiation detector. It's sensitive to collisions of any particle down to very low energies. These are the kinds of interaction rates that you expect in this detector if you are going to be sensitive to WIMPs. So from the limits that we can now set, so from existing results, we know it's gonna be smaller than this. So 0 0.01 events interactions per day. So we're talking about uh, one interaction in, in a thousand days, but it could be as low as this. So theory says that if dark matter is these WIMPs, it could be as low as this rate, which is a really, really small rate, which is a few events in many, many tons of, of, of detector material per year. And I'm going to show you uh, so why this is a challenge. I'm going to try to play this video and, and hope that you can see that. Okay. So Alan, maybe give me the thumbs up if you So now I'm going to try to demonstrate some of these challenges by using some props that I collected here in my office. So at the center here, we have a sensitive radiation detector that looks a little bit like a Geiger counter, but it's in fact a scintillation detector that has a probe and it has some control and display electronics here. So what is inside this probe? Inside this probe, there's a crystal, a little bit like this one, 
which is a scintillating crystal, and every time this is struck by a particle or by radiation, it emits a tiny flash of light. And the next thing we need is one of these, a photomultiplier tube, which is a really sensitive radiation detector that we couple to our crystal so that we are able to detect particles from radioactivity. So that's essentially what is inside that scintillation probe. So the probe is off now. If I switch it on, and because there are no obvious sources of radioactivity around here, you don't expect to see or to hear very much, but in fact you do. So just from background radiation, we are detecting something like 20, 30, 40 counts per second. And this is really a key realization that radiation is all around us, is inside us, around us, in the air, on the walls. Every material has trace amounts of radioactivity. And this is something we need to shield against because at the end of the day, we're trying to look for really rare, rare, rare interactions that only occur a few times per year, if we are lucky. And so we need to find a way of getting rid of all of this count rate. So let me show you an example. It's a bit of a cheat, but it's a nice example. This is a little bit of rock. It's quite a special rock, but it's natural rock nonetheless. It has a little bit of uranium. And if I wave this in front of the scintillation probe, you can see how much radiation comes off it. So how can we avoid this? Well, the first thing we can do is to shield against some of this radiation. So let's try to insert our scintillation probe inside this lead pipe here. And you can hear immediately that things are much quieter now. So the count rate has gone down to something close to 10 counts per second. So this shielding is, does a good job, but doesn't do a very good job. If I wave the rock again, you can hear that the Geiger counter is still unhappy about that. So you need a lot more shielding than this. But you can go some way by shielding your experiment. But in fact, you need to do a lot more than that. If this scintillation crystal were a little bit radioactive as it is, that in itself will generate quite a large number of counts per second, and your photomultiplier tubes also need to be completely radio pure, otherwise they are going to contribute to that radioactivity. And so at the core of our detector is this xenon medium. Liquid xenon is the active material, and that medium has to be very, very pure, otherwise you're going to be completely dominated by the background of the target material you are trying to use to detect dark matter. Liquid xenon is an excellent scintillator. It can be purified to extremely low levels of radioactivity, um, and therefore it's, it's the leading technology to look for, for dark matter. Unfortunately, it is also very expensive, and that's, that's why this, uh, this board game exists called Xenon Profiteer, but it's a fantastic medium to detect, to try to detect dark matter interactions. There is one other thing we need to do, uh, and that is, if you do all of this, you construct your detector from very clean materials, and you shield your detector as well as you can with tons or tens of tons of lead or ultra pure water or something like that, you still have a certain residual count rate which comes from cosmic rays that rain down on us from outer space. And you need to do something about those, otherwise your experiment is never going to be sensitive enough. And so that is why we have to go deep underground. And so that's represented here by this minus lamp. One kilometer, two kilometers of rock is really what you need to attenuate that cosmic ray flux to levels that are low enough uh, for these 10 counts per second to become a few counts per day in the large detector. Okay, so I hope I persuaded you that this is what you need to measure, but if you take your kilogram, uh, so you're trying to measure the, a particle that interacts and deposits a little bit of energy in the active medium, and then disappears again, you're trying to measure this little flash of light, but if you just switch your detector on, all hell breaks loose because you are looking at essentially the radioactivity from the medium, from your containers, from your materials that you use to build a detector, from your walls, and, and so on. So, uh, so that's a particular problem. In, in addition, if you have any neutrons interacting in your detector, neutrons are a fatal background in the sense that neutrons are also long-lived and, and neutral, and move and have more or less the right energies to collide with the nucleus of 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 uh, inside your target and produce a recoil of a nucleus. And so we cannot tell an interaction of a neutron apart from the interaction of a wimp. So we cannot have any neutrons everywhere. So we have to be care quite careful with that. So how do we build a wimp detector? So the first thing is we move on the ground. That shields us from the co from cosmic rays by 
a factor typically of 10 million or so. So the cosmic ray flux is about 10 million times smaller where we are in the ground. You need to build your experiment using radio pure materials. And this takes an, quite a number of years to actually find the right materials and then purify the materials. And this is a huge screening program. In the case of LZ, we screened maybe two, 3,000 materials to get to the right materials to build the detector from. Uh, and that applies to everything that goes into building the detector and your shield and so on. You then need to shield against uh, uh, gamma rays. So we used to do that with lead, a lot of lead. Now we do this with large tanks of water. And we need to shield, shield against neutrons. And uh, typically, water does a good job for both gamma rays and neutrons. But there is one thing you can do, which is a bit better, which is to instrument the shield. So the, if the shield becomes a detector, that actually also helps you a bit. Because if you have an interaction simultaneously or uh, sort of within a very short space of time, in your detector as well as the veto, you know it's not a WIMP. WIMPs interact so 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 feebly and so rarely that they're not going to interact uh, in the two detectors at the same time. And that is one last thing you need to do. Most interactions from radioactivity are particles of, for example, gamma rays and so on, colliding with the electrons in atoms and recoiling. So these, these electrons recoil, and it's the recoil of that electron that you detect. So gamma rays, and other electrons, they cause electron recoils because they are interacting with electrons in the atom. Whereas WIMPs, we think, and also neutrons interact with the nucleus and they scatter from the nucleus and the nucleus recoils. And so your detector technology should have a way to distinguish between nuclear recoils and electron recoils because nuclear recoils is what we're looking for. It's the signal, whereas electron recoils is most of the background. So this combination between these two types of interactions is also essential. So then we move on to the Lex Zeppelin experiment. And you can see at the center of the Lex Zeppelin experiment is the Xenon detector that you can, that you can see here in, in this nice photo uh, taken in our lab in South Dakota uh, a couple of years ago after the assembly was complete. And I'm going to explain you how we kind of fulfill all of those, uh, all of those experimental requirements and how we meet those challenges in, in LZ. First, I'm going to tell you what it, a little bit about where it is. So this is the nice Black Hills of South Dakota. Uh, sort of in sort of the in the United States, and and you can see here this head frame, which is the head frame, one of the two head frames of the mine. And then if you go down a mile from this point, you can see that here. If you go down a mile here, you come to a laboratory called the Davies Laboratory, which is where the experiment is being assembled. Uh, and so, this is the town of Leeds in South Dakota, and and this here is the very beginning of the mine. So the, this was a gold mine, one of the largest gold mines in the world, and in fact. The, this homestake mine was, was where a lot of the world of the gold in circulation in the world now actually came from during, during the original, uh, starting out, take, dating back to the original gold rush uh, in, in the 1800s in the United States. So they started by cutting away this enormous hole and at some point they realized they were running out of gold and so they started digging and digging and digging and so they realized it was better to intercept the, the seam uh, elsewhere on the ground. Uh, so uh, famous things are, for example, Mount Rushmore is not far away. Uh, the Sturges Rally, which is the biggest biker rally in the world, is, 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 is just next door, 10 minutes away. Uh, and so the mine is really sort of was a big part of the local community. But it's an absolutely staggering and beautiful part of, the, of South Dakota, uh, this Black Hills uh, National Park. So we are a mile down there. So this is what the experiment looks like. So the experimental cavern is actually quite small, and that's because it's been repurposed from, from a previous experiment, which was Ray Davis's solar neutrino experiment uh, in the 60s and 70s. And we just about managed to fit the experiment in there. So this is the cavern. You've got the shielding water tank, which is here. And the experiment, uh, the cryostat of the experiment is here. So xenon is only liquid at minus 100 degrees Celsius. And so you need a cryostat to keep the detector at a very low temperature. Uh, and then you've got all of the ancillary systems, gas purification systems, electronics, and so on, all in a reasonably uh, tight space. So if you zoom into the water tank, you can now see the core of the experiment. So this is uh, what we call a time projection chamber, liquid xenon time projection chamber, which is much more sophisticated than just a simple scintillation probe, as I'll explain in a second. That is kept at minus 100 degrees inside this very low background titanium cryostat, which was also sort of manufactured or designed in the UK. So that's the, the main cryostat that keeps this target at, at minus 100 degrees. And around it, we have a veto detector. 
So this is an instrumented vitreol detector, which has liquid scintillator, which is much cheaper than liquid xenon, has another 20 tons of liquid scintillator, and again, more photomultipliers. So there are photomultipliers pretty much like the same, the one I showed you in that video, but they are much more special photomultipliers. So these photomultipliers were developed especially for the experiment. It took many years, and, and they have very, very low radioactivity. So a normal photomultiplier will emit a gamma ray per second, for example, and these photomultipliers emit more or less one gamma ray per hour. So we had to work really on screening all of the materials and changing components and working with manufacturers to come up with these very special uh, photomultipliers. And, and the veto is also is also viewed, so this liquid scintillator tank is viewed by other photomultipliers that sit in the water space. So essentially LZ is a set of nested concentric uh, detectors to really shield uh, to be as as hermetic as possible against the external radiation. So the experiment started uh, designing in 2012, and uh, a lot of these things take a really long time to design because it's all about attention to detail. So the radioactivity of each component, how the components come together, and so on. So it takes a really long time to design these experiments. And we started the construction in 2015, and we are finishing. We finished construction essentially this year. So six years of construction, another few years of design. So this essentially is a decade of preparing the experiment and then a few years running and taking data, which is actually quite typical in dark matter experiments, just because th th these are not quick and dirty experiments. The attention to detail that is needed is, is quite, quite substantial. So at the core of the detector, so there's the xenon detector here, and the xenon detector is then, as I'll explain in a second in a bit more detail, uh, essentially it's a cylinder of Teflon, which is a, an excellent reflector for xenon scintillation light, and there's an array of photomultiplier tubes looking up in the liquid, and there is an array of photomultiplier tubes looking down from the gas phase. So the liquid reaches up to this level here, so there's a bit of gas, which is an important part of the detector. And so all of this is at minus 100, all of this is ultra-low radioactivity. At the core of the detector is liquid xenon, so there's about 10 and a half tons in total of liquid xenon, but the active part is about 7 tons. Uh, xenon comes from, from extraction, it's extracted from air essentially, but there's only nine parts per billion in, in air, which means it's actually quite an expensive, uh, quite an expensive uh, material. It's used by a few things, so for example, electronics and lighting, so there used to be lots of xenon lights, for example, in cars and so on. Now they've been replaced by LED lighting, and for us that's great because the price of xenon has come down a bit because of that. Uh, another major use is actually uh, space propulsion, so electrically assisted propulsion. Uh, so xenon ion drives are sort of quite, uh, uh, quite an attractive um, propulsion uh, mechanism. Uh, and also for an anesthesia. So xenon is a really good anesthetic, and it's now been approved in Europe as an anesthetic. And so these are three of the main uh, uses of, for the xenon market. But now, actually, dark matter experiments are also a major, uh, a major. Um, uh, user of, of, of Xenon. And in fact, we are comparable or even bigger than some of these major uses. So uh, Xenon is expensive and there isn't a lot of it. And we are fighting with the big uh, medical industries, electronic industries and space industries. Uh, so uh, that, that's a, uh, it, it's certainly a, an issue. Uh, Xenon has many isotopes that are all stable. And so if you buy a kilo of Xenon, it will have all of these. And for us, that's actually quite good. There's quite a lot of physics you can do using the different isotopes that are present in your uh, in, in your detector. We can do dark matter physics and you can do uh, neutrino physics as well. So what does this, uh, how do you instrument that xenon detector to be sensitive to, to very low energy interactions? So you've got your field cage made from, from Teflon. You've got your top array of PMTs, the bottom array of PMTs. A particle comes in and interacts somewhere. So it interacts with a xenon atom, either with the electrons creating an electron recoil or with the nuclei creating a nuclear recoil. So anyway, it deposits a small amount of energy. And the first thing that happens is a flash of scintillation light, which we call S1 light. So that is pretty much like the scintillation probe. So a small scintillation flash that is detected by the photomultiplier tubes that are either on top or, or, or at the bottom. And if you're looking at an, at an oscilloscope, for example, you would see a tiny signal, which is the flash of scintillation that you detect uh, with your photomultiplier tubes. But we have also other structures inside the detector. There's a grid here, and there's an, another electrode grid here. So these are grids made from very fine wires, and they allow us to apply an electric field, a strong electric field in the detector. And that means that 
when the particle interaction releases, shakes off some electrons inside uh, around the interaction site, we can pull these electrons off and we can migrate them to the surface of the liquid. And when they go into the gas, they emit a second flash of light because in the gas, it's actually much easier to excite the medium. And so you then produce a much bigger flash of light, which you can see here, that we call electroluminescence light or S2 light. So every interaction has two signals, a prompt signal, which happens exactly at the, at the interaction time, a time delay as your electrons move to the surface of the liquid, and then a big flash of light, which is the S2 signal. And every single interaction has two of these. And these allow you to do maybe three things that a simple scintillation probe or a Geiger counter cannot do. They just give, give you a click every time a particle interacts. This gives you a lot more information. It is not just these two, because every photomultiplier can give you information about them. So in fact, you have in LZ 500 of these timelines that you can use separately. So the particle energy essentially is the size of the two signals. You can reconstruct how much energy was dumped in the xenon just by the size of these signals, which is very small amounts of energy, one kilo electron volt, for example. You can reconstruct the interaction position, this, this position here in three dimensions, which is really important. So as the electrons go up and form the S2 signal, you can look at the splash of light in the top array, and that tells you in X and in Y exactly where that interaction was. But the clever thing is that the time delay between an S1 and S2, essentially this time between here and there, which is a few tens or hundreds of microseconds, is directly proportional to the depth of the interaction. So that gives you the depth as well. So you have X, Y, Z, three dimensions. You can localize that interaction with great precision, a few millimeters. And that's why this is called a time projection chamber. Essentially, you are projecting the depth, the depth dimension into the time axis. So you can measure these things in three dimensions. And finally, you can tell which type of interaction this was, if it was a nuclear recoil or an electron recoil, by the ratio of these two signals. A large ratio like this one is an electron recoil. For the same size of S1, if you had a smaller S2, that would be a nuclear recoil. So we can tell a lot about these interactions just by using the full information from, from the detector. So how well can we do in terms of background? So you remember that we were seeing about 30 counts per second uh, in, in that scintillation probe. And I estimate that that crystal might have been about 100 grams. So this is the count rate that you would have, 26 million counts per day per kilogram of, of material. Because if, of the low background construction and because we are underground, if we switch on LZ and when we switch on LZ soon, we are expecting to see about 10, 10 counts per, the, per second, but in seven tons of active material. So active material means all the liquid that's contained between these grids here. That's 7.0 tons of liquid xenon. And then if you present this in the same units as that blue number, you end up with 120 counts per day per, per kV, which is much better than that. The next thing you can realize is that most of the interactions from background come from the outside and try to attack from, out, from the outside in. And the important thing about liquid xenon is that it's a very dense material. It's, it's, it's about three grams per cubic centimeter. So in fact, it's denser than aluminum. It's very hard for radiation from the outside to penetrate into the core of this, uh, of this detector, except for WIMPs. WIMPs can penetrate through the detector with no problem at all. And if you look at this map, this heat map is essentially a map of background. And you can see that the background is gathering around the edges of the detector. And because we have the ability to reconstruct its, its interaction location very precisely, we can cut in our analysis. So this is done in data analysis. We, we can cut to an inner volume. We call it a fiducial volume. And we only analyze inside the fiducial volume because it's a very quiet volume. And we know that outside of that volume, it's mostly background. And that then cuts the count rate to something which is much smaller. So 0.0002 counts per day per kV. And we go from here to here, mostly by applying this fiducial cut, because we know where the interactions are, and we can sacrifice the external xenon, because we know that's affected by a lot of background. So the final trick we play is that most of the interactions are actually not nuclear recoils. They are electron recoils, by far. Uh, and so in, if we apply this discrimination by doing the ratio of the, SU, the S2 to the S1 signal, we end up with this count for background, which is the background of the experiment, which is something like one count per year in the 5.6 tons that the fiducial mass is. So, th so this is the 5.6 ton mass inside here, 
And this is the counterweight that we think we will have from background interactions only, which will be nuclear recoils. And that really is a very small number, much more like the numbers of WIMPs that we would be expecting to measure. So that's how we decrease the background from a normal radiation detector all the way down to something that is really, really quiet so that we can detect low energies and rare events at the same time. So I'm going to show you some pictures of the construction of LZ. Uh, so this is the one of the photon arrays, the photon multiplier arrays. This thing is about 1.6, 1.7 meters in diameter or so. So this is the bottom array. It has a nice hexagonal pattern. And this is the top array. And between the, uh, the, the photon multipliers, there is Teflon. So in this detector, there is Teflon everywhere because tef Teflon is a magical reflector for xenon scintillation light for reasons that are only not completely understood. So the reflectivity is about 98% at that specific wavelength. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Teflon shrinks a lot at low temperature. And so we, we cannot just have a Teflon plate and cut out the spaces for the PMTs because that would distort when you cool. And so all of these things are individually machined and individually designed components that lock together in some way that then seals, almost seals at, at low temperature. Uh, so it, it took quite a long time to design and manufacture these structures. So this is the bottom. This is the front of the top array. This is the back of the bottom array. You can see there's a, a lot of cabling and other sensors there. All of this is ultra low background materials. And because the radioactivity is not just in the materials, it's also in the air, for example, we have to avoid plating out radioactivity in the surfaces of the detector. And so we constructed these, uh, these uh, transport boxes that were also assembly boxes. And during assembly, they had a lid. And this is the lid. And that lid had a hatch. And we only operated to assemble the array on that hatch. And when we, once we finished the PMTs in that hatch, we would move, rotate the door to work on a different part of the array. So we are protecting uh, most of the array from radioactivity in the air, for example. This is the, the barrel of the, of the detector, so the, the field cage, which is made from individual PTFE segments. Again, we don't want to make this from a single PTFE barrel because at low temperature, there'll be distortions. There are uh, also some components inside here, like resistors and capacitors and so on. Uh, so this is all also made from many thousands of components. The grids that one, one of them you cannot really see, but it's here, between which we, we apply the electric fields, and you can actually see one of the grids here, uh, are also very special. And we found that we could not find any commercial manu provider uh, for those grids, which are essentially woven meshes of very fine metal wire. So we had to actually go back to the drawing board and we designed a loom and we had to learn how to weave and we started weaving high quality ultra low background um, um, grids in, in the clean room which took several years to complete but we have grids which are really quiet and even then when we were assembling the detector in very clean conditions in clean room conditions we would still inspect the detector every day for particles of dust with a uv light so this all of this is takes a really long time so this was the detector having come together. So I was actually on site when we, uh, when we completed the assembly uh, in late to, in about August 2019 or so. The detector, so it's about maybe at this stage about three meters tall. You can see the top photon multiplier array here. The extraction region, so that's two grids and the liquid surface will be between them. You've got the field cage, you've got the cathode here, another grid down there bottom photon multiplier. So everything that is in contact with xenon is white. We want to try to recycle as much light as possible. And PTFE is also incredibly radio pure. Uh, and so this was a really nice uh, sort of time to be on site and see all of this come together over a period of, of a couple of months. So after the manufacture of the components off site, we then assembled this uh, at the, in the surface laboratory uh, in, in South Dakota. So then what happens to it? So the next thing that we had to do was to insert the detector inside the inner cryostat vessel because we cannot transport such a fragile and delicate thing into the radioactive air of the mine. So the mine is not particularly radioactive, but everything is radioactive. And so this had to be sealed. And we decided we were going to do that already in the inner vessel of the cryostats. Uh, and so this is the lowering of the detector into the inner vessel. And then we put the lid on. You can see plenty of cables here. And then that gets assembled into a transporter shell. So this is a shell that has some skates and that get, can, be, can be picked up by a forklift. And these are, these are already the cables for the conduit, the conduits for the cables that are already connected inside to the detector. 
uh, the detector had then to be turned on its side because it could not go on the ground, could not be transported vertically, so it goes into this transport shell. It gets extracted into the roadways and we pick the nice cold day in South Dakota. The weather changes very quickly and I remember we had planned a good day and suddenly the temperature dropped 20 degrees Celsius or so overnight, which is not uncommon there, but we, we went anyway. And then it gets picked up by a kind of a telehandler and then it has to travel to this, uh, to the Yates uh, shaft frame, head frame here that you can see here, which is a few hundred meters away. So this is the arrival of the detector going into the Yates shaft. And then we stop and this is the cage that takes personnel on the ground. But of course the cage is not big enough to take the detector. The detector has to be suspended under the cage and has to be lowered one mile suspended under the cage, which is really a seat of the pants kind of operation. So this is the detector on the surface having been picked up by the uh, by the, the mine mechanism. And this is it arriving underground about 10 minutes later, maybe actually 10 minutes is how it normally it takes us to get underground, maybe five, six minutes. This is actually longer because we did it more slowly uh, than normal. But then this has to be extracted into the lab and there isn't enough head height to transport this thing vertically. So. So this is what we had to do. So there is a small railway in the ground that exists for mining days. And then the winding mechanism has to lower the cage at a certain determined rate at the same time that we pull with this, uh, with this locomotive, we pull this thing and, and then we, we sort of taper the angle off so that we, we reach horizontal very slowly. So this was a really difficult operation, but we had practiced with a mock detector and so on. And we knew this was going to be fine. So then this is mounted on a kind of an airbed, uh, more a bit like a ho hovercraft kind of a, a kind of system with compressed air. And this has to be moved a couple hundred meters into the lab, a bit like Wallace and Gromit. So we are putting sort of some, some metal shimming to make it uniform in front of it and removing it from the back of the detector and running to the front of it. And so this is a nice photo and it gets really tight. And so in fact, it gets so tight, we had to mock exactly this and we did the trials with the mock uh, uh, construction and we had to disassemble part of the pipe work along the way to make sure that it fitted. Uh, but on the day it went really well. So then we are arriving at the interface to the clean lab. And you can see from here that they, the, the, the lab gets much cleaner. It's not those dirty mine corridors. It's still tight. Uh, so this is already inside the lab, the corridors inside the lab. And then we are getting into the Davis campus. So this is a liquid nitrogen system that will cool the detector. This is the detector arriving uh, just above the water tank. So the water tank is underneath here. This is in fact is the hatch to the water tank and this is the detector arriving near the water tank. And finally we are in position. And then a day later we start lowering the detector inside the outer cryostat vessel. So inside the water tank, which is what you can see here. So there's the water tank, we arrived here. Then we have to insert this through this hatch. Inside the water tank, the legs of the outer cryostat vessel were waiting and the cryostat was already bolted to the floor and aligned and so on. There's a couple of vessels, a few vessels you can see are pushed against the wall, which, which, which belong to the outer detector. And then the last part of this operation was to lower the inner vessel of the cryostat inside the outer vessel of the cryostat. So this happened more or less before the pandemic struck and, and uh, the COVID pandemic actually then delayed this quite, quite a bit after that. So I mentioned the auto detector and, and uh, it's a reasonably difficult staging process because you can't lower these large scintillator tanks after the detector is in place. And so they had to be in place well before we lowered the, the, the detector transporter, uh, the inner vessel into the outer vessel. And so that's what you could see in that, uh, in that picture. So this is one of the acrylic tanks for the, for the outer detector being lowered. Then all of them get gathered around the cryostat. And this is what you see here, for example. So this stage here is LZ, the LZ Xeno detector already uh, clad with some reflective material and then the acrylic tanks uh, around it. And this is a picture taken, taken not long ago. So then after that, we have to erect these ladders that contain more photomultipliers and more reflector and more sensors and so on. And they are looking at the scintillator uh, material uh, that, that is about a meter away inside the water tank. And so this was taken inside the water tank not long ago. 
So I, I can't do justice to the other subsystems and there are many, but just to tell you that there really are a very large number of very complicated systems that include cryogenics, gas purification, electronics, controls, calibration, and so on. They're all, all highly interconnected. For example, our control system has to read out about 20,000 sensors. And so just integrating the sensors and designing the software that can control all of these sensors and keep them talking to each other and protecting the very expensive xenon payload is quite, quite a task. But one that I should mention is that although the xenon in itself is pure, it is contaminated by, uh, if you buy it commercially, it's contaminated by small amounts of krypton. It's very difficult to separate krypton from xenon. And when you extract the xenon from the air, it comes with some contamination of krypton, typically about a few parts per million. So we've had to process this xenon in gas phase to about 100 parts per quadrillion of, of krypton, because krypton is a radioactive gas. And so we had to design and build a, a, a gas chromatography plant where we essentially we flow slugs of xenon, maybe one kilogram at a time through these charcoal columns. And this works like your lateral flow uh, chromatography for COVID to test COVID, that uh, the, the lighter and more mobile substances punch through more quickly. So the krypton punches through more quickly than the xenon through these columns, and then we can divert it to a different storage. And so we have to do this for all of the xenon, which is 10 and a half tons in gas form. So this takes a long time. Uh, and so this is to tell you, so if you ask, where are we? Uh, I, I, I can tell you, but I cannot tell you. So the, the, the official line is that we are commissioning. So commissioning means we've got everything underground and installed. We are just final, finalizing, connecting all of, the, uh, all of the components together. Where are we headed? So if we expose, L, expose LZ to what we hope is dark matter WIMPs for a few years, this is the kind of plot that we are going to be analyzing, many, many plots, but this is one of them, and maybe the, the, the most important one. So on this axis, this is the size of our S1 signal in detected photons. So this is 10 detected photons of scintillation, 20, 30, 40, and so on. So it's small numbers of photons. And in this axis, this is the size of your S2 signal, again, in logarithm of det detected photons. And we expect to see a number of events clustering around this blue band, which is electron recoil. So electron recoils, you may remember, I told you, generate more S2 proportional in, in proportion to S1. So they have a higher ratio of S2 to S1. And so they appear higher on this band, whereas nuclear recoil interactions would cluster around this, this red band instead. So for example, a 40 GeV WIMP would create new interactions in this, in this region here. And the very light wimp or some very, or some some neutrino fluxes would create interactions down there. So this is what we are expecting to see. So it's it's a set of maybe 10, 20 events appearing on this band here, uh, whereas most of the background will appear in that region here. And and this is the state of the field at the moment and where we want to go. So what I'm plotting here is the mass of the wimp, which we don't know. It's a hypothetical mass. It could be 10 GeV or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. And this is the probability that that wimp interacts with the nucleus. And these solid lines here are existing results. So everything above them has been excluded. And so LZ is hoping that we are hoping that we can go a couple of orders of magnitude, maybe a factor of 100 down from existing limits. So the existing limits are all from Xenon experiments because they are ahead of the field by quite some, by quite some margin. There are many more experiments up here, uh, maybe another dozen just that are less competitive. But the, the best, the three best experiments are liquid xenon experiments. And with LZ, uh, we hope to go another factor of 100. And you'll see here that we are covering a lot of this parameter space, which is actually favored and a lot of types of types of, uh, of, um, of theories that could explain other problems in particle physics. So this is a very interesting part of the parameter space where these WIMPs could be hiding. So my conclusion. Uh, so the quest to discover this dark matter continues. And, and I, I spoke about one particular technology, one particular collaboration, but there are many technologies. This is now, there are probably tens of thousands of people working around the world in this area because it's really a very important, uh, a very, a very important area. And because of that, and because we've become a lot more sophisticated in how we approach these experiments, I think we have a good chance of discovering something in the next few years. And LZ is coming online soon. I can't tell you precisely when, but we will start taking data this year. Uh, so that's clear. And I, I think it's, I mean, it's the flagship experiment. It's the experiment that on paper has the best sensitivity. Uh, and we, we think really that this will be the experiment to, to look at, to follow in the next few years. And this is our best shot at the dark. So keep an eye out.
and I'll leave you with the thanks to the LZ collaboration, which is really a fantastic collaboration, uh, and to our funding agencies too. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Enrique. That was uh, that was quite uh, quite fascinating. I hope it wasn't too long, but maybe it was. I no, no, you, you. I think we're still we're still good. We have um, we'll have some questions in just a moment once I get hold of them. They're uh, not far away. Here we are. If anyone else has any questions, please do type them in now. This is your chance. Um, we have one from um, uh, Colin Jackson, who asked, uh, "How much did the, uh, ha has the experimental effort cost, and who is funding it?" Uh, so. I, I can tell you because they're, they're, they are public numbers. So it cost around $75 million. Wow. Uh, most of the funding came from the DOE, so the US Department of Energy, which funds large particle physics collaborations. Uh, and mm. there was funding, substantial funding from, from South Dakota, from the state of South Dakota, in fact. Mm. In the UK, we are funded by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. So UK funding was about 10% of the total uh, of the total project cost, but we are about 25% of the collaboration. So we kind of, it's good value for money, I, I, I should think. But uh, so the entire project is funded by three or four agencies uh, and the UK has contributed about 10% of the total cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another one from Philip. Um, after all this time and effort, what is your estimate of the chance of actually obtaining successful results in finding WIMPs? So that, that is a very uh, difficult question for a physicist. It's what we call a Bayesian question. So what is the probability of your model? Um, yeah. So I, I'll, I'll answer with this plot. So if I can find it here. This region of parameter space here yeah. has this shape for two reasons. So it has this shape from this, this side. So from if you're going down because dark matter experiments have been pushing this parameter space down. And so that's why the favored parameter space has this shape because it's kind of parallel to the Xenon experiments that we've been pushing down where this dark matter can hide. Mm -hmm. The dark matter space has this shape because the LHC is the, the, the LHC collider and the experiments at the LHC are pushing to the right on this parameter space. So we are very complementary in, in how we approach this uh, search for dark matter. They are pushing to the right and excluding at higher and higher energies, and we are pushing down. And together we are constraining this dark matter to hide in this region here. If you talk to physicists at the LHC, they are still quite convinced that we need a lot of physics at this scale, at this electroweak, electroweak scale, to explain many things in the standard model to do with the Higgs boson, for example. And for dark matter, we are saying exactly the same thing, that what, what allows us to explain the anomalies of the Higgs boson, and in fact, why it is so light, also produces a dark matter candidate, which is fantastic. So we think it's uh, there's a really good prospect that this thing could be hiding here. But I, I cannot put a, a probability on it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I normally answer that by I vote with my feet, right? Because if I choose to de dedicate my career and really hard work to do this is because I believe that we can do it. But I cannot tell you it's 50% or 70% or 90% or 10%. I, I mean, it's a belief that I think if you're going to look anywhere, you should look in the best motivated region because you have more of a chance of finding it. But uh, I, I cannot put the probability on it sure. as much as I would like. Okay, thank you. Good answer. But of course, you're, you're, you're all the time improving the, um, <clears throat> the sensitivity of the experiment. So you're, you're driving down as to where the... You're driving down. And it's also important to prove what it is not. If you yeah. can rule out entire regions of the parameter space, then you can do that forever. And you, you can prove that dark matter is not this type of particle once and for all, for example. Right. OK, let me move on then to another question from uh, Rob Williams. Could dark matter be a mediator or driver of radioactive decay, i.e. interacting with it actually causes what appears to be the spontaneous decay of, uh, of, a, of particles like a neutron? So that's an interesting question. Um, there is a putative observational dark matter that we don't believe, which is an experiment called the DAME experiment that has been running in Italy in an underground laboratory for 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. They see a signal that they have claimed for many years is from dark matter. The problem with that signal is it sits somewhere up here, many orders of magnitude where everybody is already excluded. At some point, people were trying to understand maybe this dark matter is just causing some radioactive decay of something and maybe this is 
this is what's going on, and that's why it does not look like dark matter. But the fact is, we understand radioactive decay extremely well. And radioactive decay mediated by the W and the Z, uh, and the, in particular the W boson, and, and also what comes from alpha decay and electromagnetic interactions and so on, we, there, isn't, there isn't really any, any radioactive decay we don't understand and can calculate theoretically, uh, for example. So, uh, so I think that's my answer is that it's unlikely to be, uh, to be related to radioactivity because we understand radioactivity very well. There is one exce exception, which is actually the simple and humble neutron. The lifetime of the neutron, which is about 900 seconds, seems to be different depending on the way you used to measure it. And that is not completely understood. So there are theories about that that involve just technical explanations, but there is actually a discrepancy in the lifetime of the neutron, which we thought we knew very well, if you measure it in some way or if you measure it in another way. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people think that's sign of physics we don't yet know. So uh, it's, that's, that's not impossible. And, and actually the, the simple neutron is actually something that should open our minds to, to other explanations to phenomena that discrepancies we already know. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next question from uh, David Yule. Do we have evidence of dark matter affecting orbits in our solar system? No, the, the effect is too small. Um, so if you look at uh, how much density of dark, dark matter exists at the position of the sun, and, and therefore if you look at how much dark matter exists between the sun and the earth, for example, mm -hmm. or the sun and the outer planets, and you can <clears> calculate <throat> the effect that that would have on the orbits of the planets and it's really, there isn't enough of it. Right. So at the center of the galaxy where we are, there is a lot more normal matter than there is dark matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question then from Sam. Um, are there any experiments looking into axion detection? Um, wh yes. dark matter? Yes, so there are lots of experiments looking at axions and in fact, uh, so there is a, a new set of experiments that Imperial is really pioneering and I will show you in this parameter space where they sit get there quickly enough. So there are many experiments looking for axioms. There is, a, a, the, for example, the ADMX experiment, which is the leading experiment in the US with a small UK component looking for axioms. But in the UK, there is a, a big project. What is this? Big... There is a big project called ION, which is the Atomic uh, Interferometer and, uh, and Atom Observatory or something like that which is trying to address a lot of this region. So between about here and, and there. So it's a very, so it's an, it's an atom interferometer that is going to start by two atom, in, by two essentially atomic clocks about 10 meters apart and looking at in, interferometric measurements between them, then expanding to a hundred meters, then expanding to one kilometer. So this is a very ambitious and very large program. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are trying to look for dark matter waves in this region here. Uh, and then there's a, there are a number of experiments, a good half a dozen looking for axions in this region here, because this is also a region that solves problems in the standard model of particle physics. So this is another candidate like WIMPs that is motivated both by astrophysics cosmology as well as particle physics. So, so there, there are lots of people look, looking for axioms too. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, another question from uh, Paul Shah. Um, last year, an experiment in Italy, Xenon 1T, reported signs of a dark matter signal. Was that real or did something go wrong with their background? I think something is wrong with their background. So they are our competitors, direct competitors, same technology. They are building a system very similar to LZ. Mm -hmm. And what they reported was an interaction with electrons, not with nuclear recoils. Uh, and it's an interaction at a particular energy. So it's not a featureless spectrum. It's actually a, a spectrum that has a line at a particular energy, a very low energy. We think we can explain that interaction with radioactivity. So there is a, an isotope of argon-37 that we, we think is produced by cosmic rays when the xenon is on the surface, which then takes some time to decay. We think they are seeing that and we are going to be, I mean, they already know that we are proposing that this is the explanation for their signal. We don't believe they have seen dark matter. We think this is as an origin in a radioactive background they did not control. Okay, fine, right. Um... Graham Kidd has a challenging question for you. If God forbid you don't get a result, what alternative theories for dark matter do you have? What's the next experiment to be done? All of this parameter space is being covered. I mean, I think there are probably two, three dozen experiments spanning most of this parameter space. And 
the problem is because of the length of time it takes to build and operate one of these experiments, you have to choose very careful, carefully what you're going to try to do. Uh, so you have to be an expert in a certain technology because otherwise you're probably not going to make any uh, any any inwards in, inwards in that direction. You have to have a very good theoretical motivate, motivation to choose that particular part of the parameter space rather than some other part of parameter space. Mm -hmm. uh, but the entire community is trying to address all of this parameter space. So we call it now the no stone unturned, leave no stone unturned kind of approach where we are really trying to understand out of all of these energy ranges experimentally trying to understand if the dark matter could be hiding, hiding somewhere. If WIMPs are not the solution to this problem, where would I look? Uh, I, I, I do like some of the axiom theories. I think there is something in there, but I also like the experiment that we are uh, starting at Imperial, this ion uh, experiment, which I'm, I'm peripherally related to, and I think I would probably invest in that area. And uh, an attractive thing about that experiment is that it measures dark matter as well as gravitational waves of a certain in a certain frequency band. So mm -hmm. this is kind of an attractive thing that you have, you know you have physics anyway, and then dark matter is the icing on the cake, but you know that even if you don't see that dark matter, you have physics uh, through gravitational waves anyway. So, so I think this is an interesting area to look out for. It's uh, experiments looking at this region here that can look at dark matter as well as gravitational waves. Good, thank you. Um, a question from uh, a lady whom I'll just ask to unmute from Joan Blow. Can you, can you unmute yourself, Joan, and ask you a question? No. Is Joan Blow still online? And well, or type or type your question in. Okay. Uh, let me move on to another. We've just got a couple more, and then we probably need to um, call a halt before long. Um, from uh, Lai Watt to everyone, um, if successful, how might it enrich mankind, i.e. might there be useful applications? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that in, a, in two ways, one, one more humorous than another. So we have, I mean, as a species, we have this need to try to explain things. Right? I think we are born with this curiosity, and I can see where it comes from. As, I mean, as, as, as a species, species in nature that are more curious and, and understand their environment better, tend to do better, tend to flourish. I think this plants in us, at the core of our brain, a compulsion to be curious and to understand our environment. That is something that is very difficult to fight. So mankind is curious by nature. And I think it's because it's an, it's an evolutionary, evolu evolutionary advantage to know your environment. And I think it's, uh, it, this is what drives many scientists. We just want to know. We want to know the answer. So, OK, maybe that's not the, 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 the right answer. But many of the things we know about today and the technologies that we use today come from this drive for curiosity. So we don't necessarily know what is what it is for, but we know we want to know when then somebody else comes along 20 years later, 100 years later, and exploits it. For example, Einstein's theory of relativity. People ask, what is this for? What can I get out of this? And for many decades, nothing at all. And mm. now every single satellite has to correct their position according to general relativity and special relativity, for example. So the technologies we use today come, in many cases, from useless discoveries in physics 100 years ago. That when mm -hmm. people were making them, they had no idea this is how you apply your knowledge. But I'll give you the humorous um, answer. A, a friend of mine, a Portuguese friend of mine in LZ, was asked by a, a minister in Portugal what dark matter was for. And her answer was, um, well, most of the universe is made of these particles, and so it's bound to have some application in medicine. <laughs> <laughs> So eventually, we will find some application in medicine for everything we, everything we discover. <laughs> Who knows? Why not? OK, there are two questions which I'll combine, because they're really the same question. Um, is there uh, some, any kind of possibility of a link between the weak force and the gravitational force, or for that matter, between dark energy and dark matter, in your view? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So the, the, the connection between dark energy and dark matter is something that puzzles people and it puzzles me. Uh, and there are two coincidences related to dark matter that I don't like. People don't, physicists don't like coincidences. Why is the amount of dark matter comparable to the amount of dark energy at this point in time? So if you look at the history of the universe, 
In the early universe, there was almost no dark matter, dark energy. It was mostly dark matter and normal matter. And, and now the dark energy has started to increase because as space increases, dark energy has that property. Mm -hmm. And at this point in time, we have comparable amounts of dark energy and dark matter where, where they could have been orders of magnitude different. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't know why. So th that could suggest a connection between the two that perhaps we are not aware of. There is also a similar uh, coincidence between normal matter and dark matter. So why are these two things comparable in, in abundance? So one is five times the other, but not, why not 500? Why, why not so 5 million times bigger than the other? Mm -hmm. The production mechanisms for dark matter and normal matter are very different, we think. So why should they be comparable at this point in time? So again, it's another of these coincidences that maybe is telling us that there are more connections between gravity, dark energy and dark matter than we and the weak force, for example, than we actually know about. So it's mm -hmm. entirely possible. And I think that there probably is a hint in the fact that all of these things are comparable, at least at this point in the, the history, of, history of the universe. Super, right. I think it's time to, um, to, to, to draw stumps. Henrique, thank you very much for a super lecture. And I'm going to invite our chair of friends, uh, David Southwood, to, uh, to say a few words of thanks. David, are you there? Of course he is. I'm, I'm mute myself. There you are. And um, just... I can hear you, by the way. Okay, good. Well, Enrique, absolutely riveting stuff. Uh, as somebody with a astrophysical connection, I am longing for a result on dark matter. It's a standing embarrassment that uh, for astronomy that uh, we get large amounts of money to look at look at the sky, and most of what we see, we don't know what it is. So, as far as I'm concerned. Keep right on, and I'm waiting to see how this comes out. I, uh, anyhow, I think you took us to the frontiers of the universe by at the same time taking us to the bottom of a mine. Uh, 50 years ago, I would never have believed that was the way to do it, but you made it so straightforward. Wonderful description, very clear. I think you carried all of us with you uh, down the mine. And uh, listen, you're ready to go. We're all waiting to hear what happens next. So uh, I think I would like to ask everybody to express their thanks. <laughs>